I'm in Germany again. I lived in Berlin as a guest of DRD 16 years ago. I also lived in Villa Valverta in Feldafing. German Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel announced in 1994 that uh, Germany would be glad to grant me political asylum. At that time, I was uh, in hiding in my country because Islamic fundamentalists wanted to kill me, and also the government filed cases against me on the charges of blasphemy. I got Sakharov Prize for freedom of thought from the European Parliament in 1994. The president of the European Parliament was uh, German. My books were also published by Hoffman and Kampe and Ruwald in Germany. I was actively involved with Berlin-based German humanist organization. It's a long time ago, time flies. I'll tell you my story today. I hope that, I think that many of you do not know what I faced in my life. I was born in a country where more than half the population is deprived of their basic human rights because they were born as girls. I was born in a country where millions of women have no access to education, nor do they have the possibility of becoming independent. Because of the country's strong patriarchal tradition, women suffer unbearable inequalities and injustices. They suffer from different physical and psychological problems that are not treated. Women normally remain untreated because they are not taken to hospitals until they reach terminal stages. Women are not supposed to become sick because they must remain busy with household chores, bear and rear children, take care of the family, and make sure that the male members of the family are happy. A woman's destiny is to be ruled by the father in childhood, by the husband when she is young, and by her son when she is old. Women's role is to stay at home and to obey her husband. Women are considered weak, so they should be taken care of. Their body and mind, their desire and wishes, their rights and freedom must be controlled by men. Women are treated as inferior beings, childbearing machines, and mere sex objects. Far too many women suffer from trafficking, from slavery, from all sorts of discrimination. Women are flogged, they are stoned to death. Men throw acid on women's bodies, burn their faces, <coughs> smash their noses, melt their eyes, and walk away as happy men. Women are raped, are accused of allowing the rape, and the rapists are set free. Violence against women is not considered a crime in my country. And we know very well that it is not considered a crime in many other countries too. I was born in a country where married couples want male babies. For them, the most unwanted thing is a female baby. If a female baby is born, it is not uncommon that either the wife gets a divorce for her crime of having given birth to a female, or the wife must spend her life in disgrace. I was the third child of my parents. Before I was born, my parents had two boys. So I was not an unwanted child. But my childhood was not a happy childhood. I grew up in an anti-women tradition and culture. I was not allowed to do many things I wanted to do just because I was a girl. I could not go outside to play football or cricket like my brothers or swim in a lake or ride a bike. I could not talk to boys who were not my relatives. I had to stay behind the curtains when male guests came to our house. But I was obviously a privileged girl. My father was a doctor and a secular person. 
He wanted me to study medicine and become independent. I witnessed the dropout of schools of my female classmates as they were forced to be victims of arranged marriages. I was lucky. My father never wanted me to marry before I completed my education. When I was a child, my mother often forced me to read the Quran, but I could not understand the meaning of the verses that I read. Like other children, I was just parroting words. Our language is Bengali, not Arabic. It was impossible to know the meaning of the verses, for no matter how many times I repeated and memorized them, I had no way of knowing what I was saying. I was told that Allah wanted the Quran to be read in its original language. But this made me all the more curious to know the meaning of the verses. One day I discovered a book that translated the Quran into Bengali. I read it for the first time, the whole holy book. And guess what? I became an atheist. <laughs> I did not need to read any book on atheism or secularism or humanism to be an atheist. I still believe, for the Muslims, the Quran is the best book that can inspire them to becoming an atheist. Before discovering what the Quran really said, there were some incidents that helped me to become an agnostic. When my mother gave me the horrible description of hell, I shivered with fear. She always said, Allah is merciful. I could not understand how a merciful great God could punish his creatures with hell only because they didn't pray to him or were, or were not born in a Muslim family. My mother used to tell me that Allah knows everything. But when she asked me to pray, and I had to utter the verses in Arabic, I was reluctant to do it, for I did not understand the Arabic verses of the Quran. If I was going to pray, I wanted to pray in Bengali. It really angered my mother when I asked very innocently, Mother, if Allah knows everything, then why doesn't Allah know Bengali? <laughs> My mother was embarrassed and angry with me. I asked some of my relatives, and they got angry with me too. One day, as I kept reminding my mother about Allah's ignorance, she replied, if you say anything bad again about Allah, your tongue will fall off. I was eight and had no idea that anyone's tongue could do that. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, locked the door, and said, Allah is a son of a bitch. <laughs> Allah is a son of a dog. Allah is a son of a pig. All the slangs we commonly use in Bengali. Then I became worried. Maybe my tongue would really fall off. However, a minute passed, then two, then five minutes, and ten minutes, and my tongue was still there. I understood right there and then that I could say anything about Allah and my tongue stay in my mouth. I understood my mother was wrong. It was easy for me to become an atheist. I was a student of science, so it was hard to accept that the sun moves around the earth and the moon has its own light and that the purpose of mountains is to support the earth so that it will not fall down. I came to suspect that to be sure, and to be sure that the Quran was not written by someone who had any knowledge of science. We all know education of science helps people become atheists. For some people, even if it is not necessary, before studied science, I became an atheist. When I studied science, I realized that I was right, and it was so foolish to believe in superstitions. I was never really a believer of God. Probably I was influenced by my father. He helped me to become an atheist. My father was an atheist. He never prayed. He never asked anyone of his family to pray. He was busy with medical science all his life, and all he asked his children was to, was to study science. I studied science and became a medical doctor. I thought people who study science would definitely be atheists, but we know that it's not true. To my surprise, I saw the picture of my old medical college classmates that taken during Golden Jubilee of our medical college just a few weeks ago. Almost all the doctors who were once my classmates 
and who did not practice religion then are now either using Islamic veil or growing <laughs> Islamic beard. Among my friends who studied arts and became writers or poets or artists are more atheists than the friends, friend, friends who studied science. This is my personal experience, but of course it is true that the number of atheists is more among people who study science. I believe studying science is not enough to be a non-believer. You have to believe in science and apply it in your everyday life, and you have to have a curious and thinking mind. Because of my curious mind, not only did I read the Quran, I read the Hadith, the words of Muhammad, I found different events of Prophet Muhammad's life in which when he had problems, Allah was able to solve them right away. For example, when he was sexually aroused after seeing his daughter-in-law, Allah sent him a message saying that he could marry her because, because as his son was adopted, he was not the, his real son. So the, that marriage was therefore permitted. Further, he created a new law that Muslims are not allowed to adopt any children. Muhammad married 13 times. One of his brides was Aisha, a six-year-old six child. Allah, he said, told him that he was allowed to enjoy his wives, his female slaves, and all the captive women he possessed. He put his beautiful young wife Aisha in a veil because he did not want his friends looking admiringly at her. Allah, he said, told him that his friends should not just go to his house anytime they wished, but if they go, they should not look at any of his wives or ask any of them for anything or any favors. Muhammad was so jealous that he consequently introduced the veil for his wives and ultimately for all Muslim women. Even though marrying a widow was legal at that time, he made it illegal for anyone to marry any of his wives after his death. It became clear to me that Muhammad had written the Quran for his own interest, for his own comfort, and for his own fun. I knew Islam oppressed women. When I studied other religions, I found they too oppressed women. As I grew up, I realized that like other religions, Islam is not compatible with human rights, women's rights, freedom of expression, and democracy. In a real democracy, separation of religion and state cannot be neglected. There is no way we can enjoy human rights if we allow religious rules to regulate society. Freedom of expression must include the right to be different and to offend people. A fact most of the people in many countries do not know and do not believe. Without the right to offend, freedom of expression cannot exist. And without freedom of expression, a democracy cannot be a true democracy. As I grew up, I became aware of women's human rights. I believe that Islam doesn't consider women to be a separate human being. Man was the original creation and womankind was created secondarily for the pleasure of men. Islam treats women intellectually, morally, physically as inferior. In marriage, Islam protects the rights of men and men only. The Quran gives total freedom to men saying, your women are as you feel. Go unto them as you will. Women are told to run to their husbands wherever they are, whatever they do, it is their duty. The Hadith says that two prayers that never reach the heavens are number one, those of the relapsed, those of the escaping slaves, and number two, those of the reluctant, reluctant women who frustrate their husbands at night. Islam considers women psychologically inferior. Women's testimony is not allowed in cases of marriage, divorce, and hudud. Hudud are the punishments set by Islamic law for adultery, fornication, adultery against a married person, apostasy, theft, robbery, etc. If any woman is raped, she has to produce four male witnesses to the court. If she can't, there is no charge against the rapist. In Islamic law, the testimony of two women 
is worth that of one man. In the case in which a man suspects his wife of adultery or denies the legitimacy of the offspring, his testimony is worth that of four witnesses. A woman does not have the right to charge her husband in a similar manner. Women are not allowed to inherit the property on equal terms with their brothers. In the case of inheritance, Allah says, a male shall inherit twice as much as a female. And after all the rights and freedom, after obtaining all the sexual pleasure and having the pleasure of being the master, Allah will reward men with wine, food, and 72 virgins in paradise, including the wives they had on the earth. And what is the reward of the pious woman? Nothing. Nothing but the same old husband, the same man who caused her suffering whilst they were here on earth. As I grew up, I kept observing the condition of women in our society. My mother, for example, was a perfect example of an oppressed woman. She had been given into marriage when she was but a child. And she was a good student in school, but she was not allowed to continue her study. My grandfather did not want her to study for what they wanted was for her to be a good housewife, a good mother, a good caretaker. In our house, I grew up with much fear, as I had to keep inside my heart all my desire for freedom and curiosity for what was happening in the outside world. As a result, I developed a passion for reading books, and I had another passion to write poetry. Growing up, I had to maintain the belief that girls certainly must be inferior to boys, for boys could play in a big field, whereas girls had to play with their dolls in the corner of the house. I was told that girls' role was to stay home, learn how to cook, make beds, clean the house. My mother was not the only woman who was oppressed, for I saw that my aunts, my neighbors, and other acquaintances who were playing the same roles and they too were oppressed. In our minds, torture of women was not oppression, but rather was tradition. We become accustomed to tradition. I realized that whether women, women were poor or rich, beautiful or ugly, they had blue or black or brown eyes, had white, black, or brown skin, they were unmarried or married, illiterate or literate, all were oppressed. Everywhere women were oppressed. And all because of male diverse patriarchy, religion, traditions, culture, and customs. <coughs> Nobody told me to protest, but I developed a strong feeling that it was important to fight against oppression. Nobody asked me to shed a tear, but I did. When I started writing prose that was published weekly in the newspapers, I found that my protest attracted the attention of readers, that people either hated me or loved me. One by one, my books got published, not only publisher, but also newspaper editors wanted me to, to, to write. However, those who hated me for what I wrote organized demonstrations against me, and people began protesting by marching through the streets. In the beginning of 90s, at a national book fair, my books were publicly burned, and I was thrown out of the event. I was not even allowed to visit the book fair anymore because the fair's leaders said my books were causing the problem. Next year, I returned, but this time the fundamentalists and, and an angry mob assaulted me publicly, breaking into the bookshops where my books were kept. The government then confiscated my passport, asking me not to write anymore if I hope to keep my job as a medical doctor in a public hospital. In protest, I quit the job. I continued writing. In my poetry, prose, and essays, novels, I have defended women and minority communities that are being oppressed. I cried loudly for justice and equality, justice for all people, whatever their religion or gender. I spoke loudly upon behalf of secularism. I spoke against any religious laws in which women are oppressed. My books got banned by the government. By writing books, I wanted to do something constructive. 
I wanted to help women understand that they are oppressed but must not be oppressed. I wanted to encourage them to fight for their rights and freedom. My voice, however, gave women the chance to think differently. That did not make the religionists or the male chauvinists happy. As a result, the fundamentalists took the stand of absolutely refusing to tolerate any of my views. They objected to a woman's breaking her chain and becoming free. And they could not tolerate my saying that the Quran is out of place and out of time, and that secular law with the uniform civil code for women is an absolute necessity. <coughs> the fundamentalists issued fatwa against me and set price on my head. They broke into newspaper offices, sued my editors, publishers, and me. They demanded my execution by hanging. Hundreds of thousands of fundamentalists took to the street. I think that they commit ultimate blasphemy by thinking that they need to protect their God, rather God should protect them. They call general strike all over the country, demanding that I be killed. Countrywide, viol countrywide violence was executed by the fanatics. The government, instead of taking action against them, took action against me. The government of Bangladesh filed cases against me on the charges of blasphemy. I had no other alternative but to go into hiding. I was certain that I would be killed, for every day I saw mobs of people demanding my death. Finally, in 1994, I was forced to leave my country. Since then, I have been trying to go back to my homeland, but I'm not permitted to return. In the meantime, many of my books are banned in Bangladesh. I have written more than mm, 30 books, and cases have been filed against me in order to ban many of my other books. A Bangladesh court sentenced me to one year in prison for having written what I did. My crime was that I said it is dangerous to follow the religious scripture in this modern world. Not only the Quran, but all the religious scriptures are out of time and out of place, and they are all anti-women. Sometimes I feel that if I only opposed religion and did not oppose the patriarchal misogynistic system, I would not have faced so much problems that I faced. It is not easy to eliminate oppressive religious systems quickly, but we can try to make a change. Both the Judeo-Christian Bible and the Quran clearly accept and condone slavery. Jesus explicitly tells slaves to accept their roles and obey their masters. No one in the world today would defend chattel slavery in any public forum or allow it to exist exist under any legal code. Neither fundamentalist Christian nor Orthodox Jews talk about animal sacrifice or slavery. Even in those countries in which Sharia law is practiced, where stoning for adultery and amputation for stealing are legalized, no legitimization of slavery is ever mentioned. Polygamy and the use of concubines are clearly accepted in the Old Testament, but nowhere in the Judeo-Christian world are either of these practices actually legalized. Thus, the insistence of the, on the continuation of practices which denigrate, oppress, and suppress women under the guise of scriptural reference is a hoax. Such practices could and should be delegitimized just as chattel slavery has been delegitimized. I think that humankind is facing an uncertain future. The probability of new kinds of rivalry and conflict looms large. In particular, the conflict is between two different ideas, secularism and fundamentalism. I don't agree with those who think the conflict is between uh, Christianity and Islam or between the East and the West. To me, the conflict is basically between rational, logical mind and irrational, blind faith. To me, this is a conflict between humanism and barbarism. While some strive to go forward, others strive to go backward. This is a conflict between innovation and tradition. The conflict is between those who value freedom and those who do not. I have been writing about women's rights and freedom, but my freedom of expression has been violated by the authorities. I have not been able to reach the readers of my country. All parts of my memoirs and other books have been banned in my country. My autobiography, I realize, is not just my life story. 
It is the same story that thousands of women know about. It tells how women live in a patriarchal society that possesses hundreds of traditions in which girls and women suffer. I have looked back into my childhood days and described the life of being a female child, told how I was brought up, explained that I had privileges that many others didn't have. I was able to study and become a medical doctor, something which thousands of girls cannot even dream about. I wanted to show where and how I grew up and what made me think differently, what made me do things differently. It is important to give other women some strength to revolt against the oppressive system that I grew up under and which still continues to oppress them. I told the truth. I expressed everything that happened in my life. Normally it is taboo to reveal rape or attempted rape by male members of one's family. Girls shut their mouth because they are terribly ashamed. But I did not shut my mouth. I did not care what people would say to me or to my family. I know well that many women feel that I am telling their untold stories too. We, the victim, should cry out loud. We need to be heard. We must protest loudly and demand our freedom and rights. We must refuse to be shackled, chained, beaten, and threatened. If women do not fight to stop being oppressed by a shameful patriarchal and religious system, then shame on women. Shame on us for not protesting, for not fighting. Shame on us for permitting a system to continue to persist that will traumatize our daughters. My story is not a unique one. My experiences have unfortunately been shared by millions of fellow sufferers. In my book, I cried for myself. I also cried for all the others who have not been able to enjoy the productive life of which they are capable and which they most assuredly deserve. We who are women must no longer remain solitary, crying softly in, in no lonely places. In this wide world, I have no country to call my own. The country where I was born and raised has abandoned me. I'm left with memories of a land and people that are intrinsic parts of my being, whose language and culture molded me. It has been 18 years now that I have not been allowed to return to my country. Even when my mother was on her deathbed, the Bangladeshi government told me I could not return. A few years after that, when my father was uh, dying, I begged, pleaded, and cried to be allowed to see him, if only for two days. The government of Bangladesh refused to permit me entry. For a decade, I wandered from one European country to the next. I sought a home but found none. I felt like a foreigner everywhere, an alien in the truest sense. I always wanted to return home. Since I knew it, that was not possible, I wanted to go to India. I could at least get a taste of home in India, but India has kept her doors firmly shut for six years. When I finally was given permission to go, I did not waste a moment. I eagerly chose India's state of West Bengal as my new home. But when I was physically attacked, by Muslim fundamentalists in an Indian state, instead of taking action against the fundamentalists, the government took action against me. I was kept under house arrest by the government of West Bengal for months. Not only that, I was repeatedly asked to leave the state and preferably the country. And then in November 2007, a group of Muslim fundamentalists organized a violent protest against my stay in India. I was thrown out of West Bengal the state that had been my home for years. It is absolutely amazing that no action was taken against those who had indulged in this violence, who burned vehicles on the street, and who put a price on my head. Instead, it was the victim who was tortured. Finally, the Indian government <coughs> took charge of me. They put me under house arrest for months. I, was ex I experienced an inhuman and miserable existence. The government of India pressured me to leave the country. But where I, was I to go? If I could have gone back to Bangladesh, I would have. I did not prefer choosing to live in one of the Western countries. India, which prides itself on being the world's largest democracy and allegedly secular state, could not shelter me. They could not sh give shelter to a person whose entire life has been spent in the cause of secular humanism. 
a person without a land or a home, who regarded India as her home, and who, as a Bengali writer, wanted to live in a Bengali environment, surrounded by her own language and culture. Was this too much to ask for? Unfortunately, today in India, if one is to be liberal, one must be pro-Islam. One must not criticize Muslim fundamentalists, even if they issue fatwa against women or writers and set price on their head. A liberal Indian must not talk against a Muslim because Muslims are a minority in the country and because a minority could be oppressed by the majority community, so all Muslims should be defended, whatever their crime. If Muslim fundamentalists want to enact Muslim laws that are def definitely anti-women, liberal Indians appear to appreciate those <coughs> demands in the name of multiculturalism. Just a few year, uh, just a year ago, 15,000 people hit the streets of Karnataka state of in, in India, burned the towns, and left two people dead. The fanatics burned down newspaper offices, and, car, and curfews were imposed in few towns of Karnataka, all because a local newspaper published an article of mine about burqa, the Islamic veil. There was no debate possible on this issue. Instead, the fanatics used it as an issue to destroy property in the name of Islam. It was a mayhem of intolerance. I wrote in, an, in the article that burqa or headscarf or veil is a symbol of oppression, and even though Islam prescribes it, women should not wear it. We can see ignorance reaching such heights that it doesn't hesitate to take lives of people. The most tragic thing is that in the largest democracy of the world, it is an accepted idea that there should be a limit to freedom of expression. The question of limitation is very much related to criticism of Islam. Islam has been largely exempt, exempted from the criti critical scrutiny applied to other religions. I have been fighting for freedom of expression for years and paid a high price for it. Just, and just last month, on, uh, just a uh, few months ago, in my book launch in Calcutta Book Fair was canceled by the authority. Why did the authority ban my book launch? They banned the book launch only because it was my book, and my book launch celebration could make the Muslim fundamentalists unhappy. Everywhere the governments compromise with Muslim fundamentalists. Unfortunately, in India, all the political parties appear to be having a Muslim appeasement policy. Muslim population is increasing, politicians are running after Muslim votes. Book banning or banning of book launch in a democracy is a matter of shame and this trend must be stopped. Our democratic values cannot be allowed to be hijacked by lunatic fringe who happen to receive endorsement from cynical politicians. It seems intolerance is increasing all over the world. <coughs> India is no different. We know that Islamic fundamentalism started rising after the collapse of communism. It has been destroying the possibility of many countries becoming secular and democratic. In India, five fatwas or Islamic religious edicts have been issued against me. I was physically attacked by some Muslim fundamentalists, received numerous death threats, witnessed violent protests, hundreds of burning vehicles, bloodthirsty mobs, and madness against my writings in different cities in India. The, in India, women have been victim of victims of female feticide, dowry murder, bride burning, gang rape, slave trade, sexual slavery, domestic violence, etc. Recently, India became the world's fourth most dangerous country for women. I'm trying my best to fight all kinds of discrimination against women by raising awareness. There has uh, been Islamization of Hinduism and the rise of Hindu fundamentalism to oppose Muslim fundamentalism. Most of the time, Hindu fundamentalists don't look different from Muslim fundamentalists. Is it the way to oppose them? I definitely do not think so. An eye for an eye is never a solution to any problem. 
the need to get secular education to become enlightened, tolerant, rational, peace-loving, and believers of human rights, women's rights, secular humanism, and democracy. India needs to have one law for all and a an uniform civil code and a strict separation of state and religion. India needs more <coughs> science schools instead of religious schools, more scientific academies instead of temples and mosques. Only then will it slowly become a modern state, free from religious bigotry, obscurantism, and fanaticism. India's biggest problems that need to be fought are poverty, corruption, women's oppression, superstitions, and casteism. <coughs> By supporting women's rights everywhere, I have criticized all kinds of religions, tradition, cultures, and customs. But to my surprise, I am labeled as being anti-Islam. This has led to some people saying that I am a Muslim hater. But they are wrong. By no means am I a Muslim hater. I always stand beside oppressed people. I stood beside Muslims when they were oppressed in Gujarat in India, in Palestine, and in Bosnia. I defended their rights to live, just as I stood beside the Hindus who were, opp who were oppressed in Bangladesh and by the Christians in Pakistan. To me, their religious identity is not important. I consider them as human beings. Nobody should be oppressed because of his or her belief or non-belief. I have always stood for this. The criticism I make of the religions, I do by writings. I do not go to harm the believers physically with the sword. I do not believe in violence. The fanatics never accept the idea to have a dialogue or debate with me or write articles or books opposing me. They come to kill me, for they are convinced by their belief in their religions that an apostate must be killed. Still, people like to believe that Islam is a religion of peace. But since my childhood, I have witnessed the opposite. I believe no country can become civilized without criticizing the dogmatic practices of its religions. Without separating state and religion, no state or society become modern. Should Islam continue to be untouchable? Many Western intellectuals who are enjoying secularism in their own country are not agreeing to criticize Islamic oppression of women for fear it might hurt the religious sentiment of Muslims. But I ask, should it remain how it is? And should women continue to suffer? Without criticism of Islam, it should it would never be possible for Islamic countries to separate state and religion, never possible to have a secular education instead of a Quranic education, never possible to stop Islam-based politics. And if such didn't, didn't happen, Islamic <coughs> states would remain in darkness forever. Women would not enjoy the right to live as human beings. Like India, even in the West, the fear of offending Muslims and the wide, wider Islamic world has kept Islam away from the type of critical scrutiny applied to other religions. In the West, people are scared of the Muslim radicals, but at the same time, unsure of themselves, they do not want to be seen taking a critical stand that might project them as anti-Muslim and betray their liberal traditions. It is unbelievable to see the amount of energy we spend to protect individual Muslims from questioning the unethical social practices of Islam. If we want to help Islamic world, we must help Islam go through a similar enlightenment process that other religions have gone through by questioning the inhuman, unequal, unscientific, and irrational aspects of religion. If an Islamic society is not capable of checking the rise of fundamentalism within itself, are we then to assume that the notion of a moderate or progressive people in Muslim society is nothing but a myth? There is a popular belief that Islamic fundamentalists are just a minority and that most Muslims are moderate. How many moderate Muslims have opposed the numerous fatwas that fundamentalists throughout the world have been issued against people? How many moderate Muslims have opposed the heinous acts of cruelty that have been perpetrated on women by fundamentalists? We all were excited for Arab revolution. But are we happy at the end? The corrupt dictator stayed in the power for decades, but did not secularize the countries, rather looted money and exploited people. 
dictators will be gone, but it seems Islamists are coming into power. Secularists are too small minority to fight Islamists. The problem is the Islamists may replace democracy with theocracy, introduce Sharia laws, and force women to be covered with the darkness of burqa, and stone numerous women to death. Women are deprived of their democratic rights in many countries, especially in, the, in Muslim countries. Democracy means nothing if it fails to provide equal rights to women. Ensuring women's rights benefits not only women, but also the men and children in their families and their societies as a whole. It also strengthens democracy, bolsters <coughs> prosperity, enhances stability, and encourages tolerance. Protecting both the human and property uh, rights of women and of all people is at the core of building a civil law-abiding society, the foundation for true democracy. Empowering women through equal access to education and economic opportunities is essential for the eradication of poverty and enables women to participate effectively in the decision-making processes that shape their communities and their lives. Education is increasingly essential if individuals are to succeed in a global and technologically advanced economy. Women's integration into the mainstream of economic life leads not only to significant economic progress for the family, but ultimately for the country as well. In Muslim countries, this movement is emerging, but very timidly. It has the uphill task for fighting religious laws and the introduction of a uniform civil code. So far, it tends to be constituted by a few individual feminists who are forced to compromise with religionists. For women's status to change, we also need enlightened leaders who believe in equality. In countries such as mine, women with a strong voice do not have the support of political leaders, whether they be men or women. Look at the countries in which women are in politics or even heads of the state. Does it follow that women in those countries are emancipated? Because of long-standing vested interests, such leaders continue to back systems that oppress women. They are not ideologically committed to changing these conditions. In South Asia, most of the women, most of the women leaders are religious or pretend to be religious to stay in the power. And like men, they adhere to the religious objectives of this establishment. I was a victim in a country where the prime minister was a woman. Because I went one step too far in denouncing religion and the oppression that it keeps women under, I had to leave the country. I believe if women are not feminists, they are masochists. I have seen women op oppose me when I talk about women's rights. Many of them say that God doesn't want women to have equal rights, so women must not have equal rights. And I have met many men who are against what is said in the danger, uh, what is said in the religious scriptures, and believe in e equality between men and women. Gender has nothing to do with this belief. It depends on one's conscience and consciousness. Muslim women who are wearing the veil and glorifying the, their subservience are obviously not going to be better the lives of the oppressed. Until a society ba is based on secularism and women are considered equal to men before the law, I do not think that politics will be able to advance the cause of women. I have criticized Christianity, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, and all other misogynistic religions. But usually no, no one complains about it thereafter. No one ta takes out a fatwa to murder me if I heard the religious sentiments of non-Muslims. But th there is no dearth of people who, without any problem, accept the intolerance and respect the religious sensitivities of those who do take out a fatwa. Such people label me intolerant without a hint of doubt. Possibly they see me as a Muslim and view my actions according Muslim religious sentiments as focus. I'm a Bengali. I have no right to live in Bangladesh and West Bengal, the lands where my fellow Bengalis live. I'm not only banished from those lands, I'm also banned and blacklisted. Publishers do not want to publish my books, and editors of newspapers and magazines do not have the courage to publish my articles. Uh, but 
And now the problem is not limited just to Bengal anymore. It is same in the other parts of India too. But this is my life. Instead of being able to live in the area of the world in which I was born and brought up, I was given the alternative to, of living in the West where I was forced to feel like an outsider. I am, in other words, a stranger in my own country and a stranger in neighboring India and a stranger in the West. Exile for me, like a bus stop, where I'm waiting for bus to take me home. Still, I don't feel any home my home, any country my country. It's a hopeless, helpless feeling to be homeless. But I have a home, I think I have a home. A home that consists of a family of people, men as well as women, who bravely oppose the forces of darkness and ignorance. This represents my true home. The hearts of people are my home and my only safe heaven, my shelter and my refuge. There is no place in this world that I can call home, it's true. But the people who support me, sympathize with me, and express solidarity with me, they are my home. They are my country. The love I receive from atheists, free thinkers, secularists, and humanists is my home. The love I receive from you, that is my home. I do not regret what I have done so far. I do not regret anything that I have written. Come what may, I will continue my struggle against all the extremists, fundamentalists, intolerant forces without any compromise until my death. I'm all the more committed to my cause. Thank you, Shun. Would you come? Do you know? Do you know uh, him? Yes, I think I do. <laughs> he is from Pakistan. He committed blasphemy. Hey. He is a medical doctor. He. Uh, in his lecture in Pakistan, he said, he told the truth. He said, Muhammad was not Muslim before he was 40 years old, which is true, because, you know, he got the idea of, uh, you know, creating a religion when he was 40. So he was not Muslim before he was 40 years old. And also he said that Muhammad's parents were not Muslims which is true, but the um, people wanted to kill him and the government, it was the government who filed cases, the government filed cases against him on the charges of blasphemy. He was in uh, prison, he was in death cell and uh, he was sentenced to death. And after three years, actually he could manage to escaped the country, now he's living in Switzerland. So when he had problems, we, IHEU and other humanist organizations actually tried to save his life. So he is, his, he is alive now, but he, if he were in Pakistan, he would have been dead by now. So I'm happy that I met him here, and, uh, and uh, I think that we should all uh, close him for this. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, atheist organization will 
uh, invite him in their next conventions to so that he can tell his stories because it's really, really, um, it's very pathetic, but you would uh, get to know that how we, pe the people who become atheist but live in uh, Muslim countries, how, you know, what kind of life actually we ha have and what kind of problems that we face. You know, we are lucky that we are alive. Thank you so much.